details matter. If we really want to take on board a new idea or a new theory coming out of the research, we can't just stick with the popular portrayal of those theories. The TED Talks, the abstracts, the headlines, we've got to dig a little deeper to make sure that the data underlying these theories really does meet the purpose we hope to achieve. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice, where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now, As you know, we're taking a journey through my new book, 10 Things Schools Get Wrong and How We Can Get Them Right, and this week we're going to focus on Chapter 5, which is entitled Mindset, The Problem with Hype. Now, The article I've selected that aligns with that chapter is called To What Extent Are Growth Mindsets Important to Academic Achievement by Sisk and Colleagues. Now, unless you've been living under a rock for the last decade, you probably know a lot about mindset. But just to be safe, mindset is a theory developed by Stanford researcher Carol Dweck a while back, and she argues that people kind of fall into two camps. The first are called fixed mindset individuals. So these people believe things like skills, abilities, talents are inborn, they're genetic, either you have them or you don't. The other group are called growth mindset individuals. These people believe that things like skills, talents, and abilities are earned, that nobody is born any one way, and that it's through our own actions, efforts, and behaviors that skills and talents are born. Now, mindset is a wonderful theory in its own right, but where things started to go a little wonky is when people started to draw it into education and argue that mindset is the key to academic achievement. In fact, Carol Dweck herself has said, mindset can matter even more than cognitive factors for students' academic performance. Now, with all this hype, it was only a matter of time until people began to develop mindset interventions. And the idea was clear. If we can give kids a growth mindset, then this is going to boost their grades and test scores. Cool. And according to some researchers, this stuff was great. So for instance, David Yeager, who's one of the big proponents of mindset in education, has argued that mindset interventions can lead to large gains in student achievement, and it has striking effects on educational outcomes. So that's where this paper steps in. These researchers say, okay, we've got about 15 years of data on mindset and mindset interventions in education. Is it really boosting academic achievement? What is the relationship between mindset and academic performance? So these researchers trolled the literature and they performed two meta-analysis. The first were just looking at what is the correlation between a person's mindset and their academic outcomes. And what they found was after combining 247 different studies, the correlation between mindset and academic outcomes in elementary students was about 0.19, in secondary students it was about 0.15, and in tertiary, so university students, it was about 0.02. Now these are all fairly weak correlations, so this suggests that mindset might not be as heavily correlated as we once believed to academic achievement, but who cares, at least there is a small correlation, especially in primary and secondary students. So this leads to the secondary meta-analysis. Here they took a look at all the research where people tried to change students' mindset. So mindset interventions, programs that help move kids from fixed into growth mindset, so we can see does this now boost academic outcomes. And these researchers were able to pool 43 different studies, and here's what they found. The average impact of growth mindset interventions on academic achievement is 0.08. Now this is incredibly small, and to make matters worse, these researchers kept digging and they found that not every intervention actually tested mindset. So you'd assume if mindset was driving the academic achievement, after the intervention you'd test students to see did your mindset actually change. Of the 43 studies they looked at, 15 never tested mindset before or after the intervention, so they have no clue what was actually changing in these kids' beliefs. And of the studies that did explore this, that showed that yes, my intervention took kids from having a fixed mindset into a growth mindset, the impact of those studies was an insignificant 0.02. So no impact of the intervention on academic achievement. It looks like changing kids' mindset really has very little to do with their academic outcomes. But let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Let's go back to that 0 0.08, and let's just assume this is the impact we can expect. What does that actually translate to? Well, more recent research has looked at this question, and it appears that 0 0.08 is equivalent to about 0 0.05 of a grade point average. So what does this mean? This means if we have 1.5 million students undergoing a mindset intervention, a whopping 1.47 million of them will not show any change in their grades or their marks. Essentially, they're going to come out exactly the same as they went in. All right, so let's bring this back to us now. What does this mean for us as educators? Well, I can think of three things. The first is this. We have to be very specific about the outcomes we hope to achieve. When a lot of people read this research, they said, well, that's it. We should drop mindset, right? 
course not. Even though mindset might not boost academic achievement, perhaps mindset for the sake of mindset is worthwhile. Can mindset help students boost their well-being, help them take agency over their thinking and their learning? Quite possibly, and if that's the case, then it's still a very powerful tool to use. The trick is simply to recognize that we're not employing it to boost academic outcomes. It's the same thing with music in gym class and art class. These classes don't really have a huge impact on standardized test scores, so does that mean we should ditch them? Of course not, they're good for their own right. Music for the sake of music, art for the sake of art, mindset for the sake of mindset might be why and how we need to use this device. Which brings us into point two, and this is for my researchers out there, we have to be very clear and open with what others can expect from our research. One of the big problems with mindset in education is that it's the researchers themselves who are making claims that it can boost academic achievement, and they keep trying to push this message to us. It can boost test scores, it can boost test scores. No, it can't. We have to be honest and say, look, it might not impact final grades, but it might still be worthwhile from a personal independent angle. And the third thing then for us as teachers is we have to recognize that details matter. If we really want to take on board a new idea or a new theory coming out of the research, we can't just stick with the popular portrayal of those theories. The TED Talks, the abstracts, the headlines. We've got to dig a little deeper to make sure that the data underlying these theories really does meet the purpose we hope to achieve. And if the details don't support the hype, then we can make a decision. Is this still meaningful for me and my students? If so, let's use it. If not, Let's just look somewhere else. So clearly this issue of hype in teaching and education is very important and has a lot of impacts. So that's what we dive deeply into in chapter five of this book. We take a look at what is this hype cycle, how does it go awry, and what can we do to pull it back to make sure we're making the right decisions for our class. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you can give us a thumbs up and subscribe below, that'll make sure more people can see this. Otherwise, I hope you're all well, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye, y'all.